And joining us now, Roger Griffiths, author of Who We Are, A Citizen's Manifesto. And I'm happy to welcome a guy who spent a lot of time thinking and worrying about citizenship to TVO tonight. Nice to see you, Roger. Great to be here, Steve. What I want to do over the next chunk of time is basically read some excerpts from your book, and then we'll okay. talk about the questions that flow from that. Here's the first one from Who We Are. Citizenship, by which I mean the laws, institutions, and symbols that define our individual membership in the Canadian nation, has the potential to raise our sights again. In fact, a revitalized citizenship may be the best and last hope for Canadians to rid themselves of their post-national ennui and reconnect with the enduring values and principles upon which Canada's greatness rests. Why does our citizenship need revitalization right now, in your view? Well, uh, for a couple of reasons. I think, again, it is a, an institution and a symbol, uh, Steve, that we've uh, neglected, that we underutilize. In a country as uh, diverse and decentralized as Canada, I think we need to glom on to whatever national institutions and symbols we have left. I, and I think citizenship is also something that, uh, unfortunately, has been uh, reduced to uh, an add-on to immigration. In other words, citizenship, we think, or I think Canadians too often discuss, as an extension of a process of becoming a Canadian citizen when you arrive as a newcomer. And then the natural born, the Canadian born, like myself, kind of get off the hook. And I think there's a lot, there's a certain hypocrisy which really annoys me, which is that Canadians kind of wag their fingers often at newcomers and say, you know, you don't know enough about Canadian history. You're not, you know, voting enough in elections. You're not becoming part of our society. Yet, yet I would say, look at the natural born. Look at our low voting rates, our abysmal knowledge of Canadian history, and frankly, our neglect of the very institution of citizenship, which we're, you know, lecturing immigrants to adopt. So I, I want to try to put an end to that hypocrisy and rebuild the institution of citizenship, both for newcomers and for the Canadian board. And underutilized means what, specifically, yeah. you're talking about? If you were a citizen and you wanted sure. to better utilize your citizenship, yeah. what would that mean, actually? Well, I look at it in the context of the distinction between rights and privileges and responsibilities and duties. You know, we spend a lot of time when it comes to discussing citizenship, if we are talking about it, uh, focused on our rights and the privileges uh, that flow from being Canadian. Uh, and what, where I think the conversation needs to shift, um, and you know, we're talking about belonging in part here, is, is to that notion of what are the responsibilities and duties I have as a citizen to my country, Canada, but also to my local community, uh, you know, the city, the town, uh, the place where I live. And I, I think that's where the kind of utilization needs to happen. I think we've got the rights and privileges taken care of. We know what they are. We love them. We, we well, sometimes complain about them, but generally that's where our focus is. I want to inject a sense of responsibility and duty and attach some real, you know, some real duties and some real onus uh, to our collective sense of citizenship to hopefully build a, a stronger sense of common identity. And you've talked about national service, which we'll get to a little yeah. later. Before we get there, one more excerpt here. I believe the first step, you say, in reclaiming the shared values and social solidarity essential to our future well-being is to remember that Canada was founded and has evolved as a nation of citizens, not a collection of communities. Now that kind of community of communities line, which Joe <laughs> Clark famously said many, many years ago and yeah. gets kicked around a lot. It does. But some would say that one of the best things about this country, of course, is our diversity. Yes. We're, we're not a monolithic place. Yeah. By calling for a social solidarity, as you have described it, based on perhaps a more stringent definition of what it means to be a citizen, right. are you messing with that? Yeah. That or undermining, perhaps is a better word, you're yeah. undermining that diversity? Uh, well, I'm purposely taking on a certain attitude uh, about Canada, which is this notion, I think spurious notion, uh, that somehow the lack of a Canadian identity is an asset for Canada and Canadians in a world of globalization, mass immigration, value change. Um, you know, the whole postmodern thesis. Uh, I think that's a dead end for Canada internationally, and I think more importantly, it's a it's a recipe for uh, uh, divisive uh, debate uh, at home. I think we need to understand that, yes, diversity is one of the great things in this country, the regional variations, the ethnic, ethnic cultural variations, but diversity is sustained by you know, the spine of citizenship, by shared institutions, by knowing something about who we are as a people and where we've come from. And Why does one suggest that the other is not possible? Well, because I think without, without uh, a, a sense of commonality, common institutions, common memory, common experiences, that diversity really just fragments into uh, what I kind of think is white noise, cultural white noise. Everybody off in their own silo, 
uh, with their own, as I write in the book, their own, I think, prejudices often about other people and other groups, you know, a nation has to be built on some shared understandings. And I think we've spent far too much time in Canada in the last few decades emphasizing our differences from one another as opposed to the much harder and more valuable work of of emphasizing and struggling to find out what our commonalities are. Fair enough, but the, the flip side of that is that when this country was overwhelmingly British, yeah. if you weren't British, you may not have felt as part of the main as, as uh, if you were. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're all so many different things, and there yeah. is no obvious one majority culture anymore in the way there was, that maybe you do. Maybe even though we're all so different, because nobody's so dominant, we don't worry about right. that. We don't feel like we're not as good as that other guy. Is that yeah. a possible interpretation? Well, look, I'm, I'm not arguing for the return to you know one flag, one throne, one <laughs> empire. Rest be assured, that's not the case of this argument, but a case of the book. It's, it's more to say that there is a common civic culture, though, and it's an interweaving of French and English history. It's the, it's the struggle for responsible government. It's the creation of uh, post, the post-war society based on principles of egalitarianism and binding the country together through national institutions. I think that's our common civic patrimony. It's not a patrimony based on a racial identity. Uh, it's a patrimony based on a kind of civic consciousness. And in this book, I try to go back and argue about how that civic consciousness emerges, what its principles are, and why it's relevant uh, to, to Canada today. And I think it's relevant to you whether you've been in, your family's been in this country for 400 years or whether you've been here for four years. I think that's the promise, that's the potential of Canada. It's the kind of, the universality of, of, uh, of, of the promise of being a, a participant in a common civic experiment. I know one of the things that, that I'm sure you remember from your time at the Dominion Institute, we, we are very proud of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Yes. We, we say we are, anyway. You point out that most of the charter applies to non-citizens living in Canada, not just Canadian citizens as well. Yeah. Is that okay? Like, are you okay with that? Well, look, I think as I argue in the book, uh, if I have a, an issue with the charter, it's the degree to which it has, to some degree, replaced or uh, diminished the role of parliament in our democratic institutions. It's in some ways Americanized our political culture. It's emphasized group and individual rights over community and, I would say, collective kind of democratic systems and norms. Uh, so look, I, I think you, you have to have a charter. It is part of a, a kind of foundational document. Uh, it gives us a, a sense of core values. But again, those core values are always focused on one's rights uh, and the intended privileges of Canadian citizenship. And I guess what I, again, trying to say is, where are the responsibilities and duties? Where is the, the, charter, of, uh, the charter of responsibilities? <laughs> not just uh, rights. Not just rights. And we're not really having that conversation in well, Canada. Let's go on to the other side. One of the, one, I mean, the most fundamental duty or responsibility you have probably is to vote, and I yeah. want to pick up on that. A number of big city mayors, as you know, think that it's time yes. to extend the vote not just to Canadian citizens, but also to non-citizens who are part of the community and, of course, uh, over whom the policies enacted by City Hall have an impact. What do you think of that idea? Oh, I think it's a lousy idea. Uh, it's a lousy idea not because you know non-citizens don't have something to contribute to the society before they acquire formal citizenship, but what it does, and this, we can talk about dual citizenship too, which I also I'm getting uh, that. <laughs> it's on my list. Uh, you know, I have problems with. Is it devalues uh, the 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 reality of citizenship for those immigrants who have stayed in Canada, who have gone through the citizenship process, who've passed the citizenship exam, who are here raising their families, it, 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 it makes that process less valuable, less important to those people that are making a commitment to Canada. The, the non-citizens or the kind of pre-citizens that some of these mayors would like to see voting, we don't know what's going to happen to them. We don't know whether they're going to follow through with their citizenship process and become Canadians. Doesn't it get them on the path, though? Does it get them on the road to being more engaged as citizens? No, but I think it's kind of you need to have a few things at the end of that road that are the reward for taking the journey. And I think we're, we're, we've now kind of said, Here, here's this whole basket of privileges, whether you're living abroad or you're new to Canada, you're not a citizen, and we're not going to make... I think that, that, that pathway, that journey, uh, we're not going to give it the value and the importance that I think it deserves for all those Canadians who have come here, who've struggled through the immigration process, and are full Canadian citizens. Another excerpt from your book, something again you're rather critical of. Currently, you say the process of acquiring citizenship in Canada is among the least demanding of the family of the nations that actively encourage high rates of legal immigration. How so? Well, a couple things. We uh, have uh, some of the shortest residency uh, requirements, so the period from when you're landed in the country to when you can apply for formal citizenship. 
I think uh, that, that period is important because that's when you acculturate with uh, your new society. It's when you uh, have the opportunity to learn a new language if that's necessary, build your own uh, kind of relationships within your community. So I, I think a longer residency period is, uh, is a good thing. I think also, frankly, our citizenship test is uh, really an underutilized uh, opportunity to help newcomers learn something about their country. It is, it's facile, frankly. Too easy. Frankly, I think it's insulting to the intelligence of newcomers. And if you talk to them once they've done this test, they'll kind of say to you, well, what's going on here? I mean, uh, I, I knew more or, you know, I know Canada is a little bit more than na naming off the provinces and, you know, uh, five kinds of uh, crops that we grow in this country. I mean, Canada is a little more sophisticated than that. So I think there are a few things we can do in that, in that settlement process between when people arrive in the country and they become citizens to make citizenship more meaningful. Should you have to know who the greatest hockey player in Canadian history is? <laughs> well, that would be a good debate, wouldn't it? It would be a good debate. <laughs> who would you put at the top of the list? Well, I'd, I, went to, I went to Afghanistan with Guy Lafleur, and I got to spend uh, two weeks with him traveling, visiting the troops in Kandahar. And I'll tell you, that guy is a great Canadian. He slept in a bunk bed. He played hockey. Uh, yeah, but he's, he's not the greatest hockey player well, of all time. Well, he's up there he's for good. me. He's up there he's for up me. There for you. Couldn't come up with a leaf? <laughs> anyway, moving on. How, do, how are we doing in this country at A, welcoming immigrants, and B, providing the services needed to, you know, bring them into the Canadian family? Yeah. Well, look, I think you, you only have to compare the rates of poverty amongst newcomers to the Canadian-born population to see that we've got a problem and that we're letting newcomers down. During, up until recently, we had this incredible economic expansion here, uh, yet we've seen poverty rates in the 1980s for newcomers mirror roughly that of the Canadian-born population, 11, 12 percent. Uh, 14 percent as the 80s go on. Once you get into the 90s and 2000s, poverty rates amongst uh, immigrant families are up at uh, almost a third of recent immigrants and their families are living in poverty. Uh, you know, it's great to, to beat our chests and say we're the world leaders in immigration. I think that's exciting. I think it's exciting that Canada is actually bold in this area of public policy. But come on, let's, let's, let's walk the talk. I mean, we have to find ways to integrate these uh, newcomers more effectively into our economy. Otherwise, as I report in the book and explore in some detail, 40% of all professional male immigrants, Steve, leave this country permanently hmm. after 10 years. So those are the very skilled laborers and workers for the knowledge economy that we know we need because our population is aging, our workforce is declining. We're gonna have a lot of baby boomers uh, racking up big healthcare costs. We need these people to stay in Canada, yet we're failing them economically. Uh, this, is, this is a huge public policy uh, challenge for Canada, and it's something we've got to get serious about now. Dual citizenship. Here we go. Canada's <laughs> policies concerning dual citizenship need to be liberated from the spurious notion, you tell us, that the lack of civic obligations attached to Canadian citizenship is a strategic asset in a world of multiple identities and allegiances. As Canadians witnessed, during the evacuation of 15,000 Canadian nationals from Lebanon in 2006, of which an estimated 7,000 returned to Lebanon almost immediately, citizens who live permanently outside the country enjoy some remarkable privileges with few, if any, obligations. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit here. How is having people in this very interconnected, globalized world, yada, 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 mm -hmm. who can build bridges between our countries and other countries not an asset? Right. I think it's an asset if they're settling in Canada, if they're contributing to uh, Canadian society. I don't think it's an asset if they're living permanently abroad uh, and yet have all the advantages or a lot of the advantages of Canadian citizenship that immigrants struggling in Canada, you know, the, the, the third of Im recent immigrants that I just mentioned who are living in poverty, you know, their, their citizenship package, the benefits that they have of citizenship aren't that different from those who are living permanently abroad. And I think that devalues citizenship for immigrants in Canada, and frankly, gives too much to citizens living abroad uh, who really enjoy, if they want, uh, great health care. I mean, they can return to the country, reestablish residency in a matter of months, uh, subsidize post-secondary education, a whole series of perks without really building this country. Uh, they are citizens of convenience, and I think it's time we deter uh, uh, People, citizens living abroad permanently and taking advantage of Canadian citizenship without contributing to the country. I'm not trying to denigrate what you're saying, but you do know it's, it's one thing for you to say that. It's another thing for a politician to actually make that happen. Yeah. I mean, if, if any minister of the Crown came out and said that, 
you know, for ex if, particularly if it were conservative. All that work, yeah. all that ethnic outreach, you know, would be for naught, don't you yeah. think? Well, actually, I, here I would commend the conservatives on something. They have legislation uh, that's gone through and that will come into law on April 17th, which will uh, see the, the children of foreign-born citizens no longer able to pass Canadian citizenship on to their children. And I think that's an important change. Yes, it'll be controversial, and yes, there are people who are who are upset about it, but you, you can't simply allow the endless dilution of your citizenship. Uh, you know, it has to matter to people. It has to, it has to have a tangible value. And I think we've, it, it's almost like we're, we're, we're underrating ourselves. We're underrating the promise of Canada by allowing our citizenship to be uh, diluted by these uh, non-resident uh, uh, Canadian uh, nationals who who aren't demonstrably contributing to this country in any way. Now, here's where i got to get personal. Okay. How many citizenships do you have? I have two. Which ones? Uh, the United Kingdom and Canada. You were born here? Born here. So how'd you end up with the other one? Well, uh, as I write about in the book, uh, and I don't want to kind of give away the conclusion, <laughs> but uh, I was motivated, like a lot of dual citizens born in Canada, to acquire a second citizenship for sentimental reasons. Uh, my grandfather fought and died in the Second World War, as a result of that, my father was born in Scotland. So that was my passport to a second passport. But I found, and it really it influenced and motivated my writing of this book, I found that living as a dual citizen in Canada, the mental gymnastics that that introduced into my mind, the sense maybe that my, you know, my connection to Canada wasn't all that secure because I had this, this escape hatch, this other passport that I could use to, to uh, you know, sail out of whatever problems or issues I might find in my day-to-day -day life. Look, living in Canada is often a frustrating thing. Uh, I found that the mental gymnastics of dual citizenship was undermining my commitment to this country. And, and I, I say that personally, and that's my own kind of personal experience and personal story. It may be different for other people, uh, but that's what I found, really at the most basic kind of emotional level. So why don't you revoke your British citizenship? Well, I've not renewed my passport, and I've started the process to uh, renounce my second citizenship. Uh, I don't, again, I don't want to come off as, uh, as someone who's uh, extreme in his views. This is a personal decision on my part. It may not be for everybody. But as I argue in the book, I think that Canadian-born citizens should not be allowed to acquire a second passport. I think it's okay to allow immigrants, first-generation immigrants, to have that second passport for the reasons that we discussed. Right. Because they should be allowed to return to their country of origin. They can bring business and other cultural linkages back to Canada. But as I say in the book, I think we should go back to some version of the pre-1977 policy of, of, and say to newcomers, you can have dual citizenship and live in Canada, but your children cannot. That becoming a Canadian citizen has a series of, I think, positive, but ultimate repercussions. Are there civic obligations you carry out on behalf of the UK as a yeah. citizen of the UK? I don't. I don't vote in UK elections. Um, I really actually haven't renewed my passport in uh, almost half a decade. So where are the mental gymnastics coming from? Well, the mental gymnastics, I think, are more coming from when you're in Canada and you have a notion that, uh, for instance, I, as you know, we just got, I was infuriated by the Quebec as nation debate. I felt that that was a devaluing of Canadian citizenship, the creation of a sub-nationality within a Canadian nationality. Well, look across the pond. Look what Europe's doing. Uh, you know, 20 plus countries coming together uh, in this incredible act of, of continental nation building to try to create some kind of pan European consciousness. There's a lot, uh, I would say, in my own views, that's more reflected in the, the politics and the civic culture of Europe than a lot of contemporary Canada today. So there is an enticement there, there's an attraction to the type of, of, of political discourse and debate in Europe. That said, we've got to understand that you know, Canada is where we have to make our collective stand. This country is facing serious policy challenges that you talk on your show about every week. And I think if there's more and more of us, Canadian-born and non-Canadian-born, who are sitting here thinking, well, maybe I'm hedging my bets. Let's see how Canada works out. If it doesn't, I can go somewhere else. I think we've got to build those bonds of social solidarity uh, amongst each other and do that through some sense that you know, this is where we make a go of it together. And to that end, let's finish up with this. National Civic Service, yes. you're putting the call out for that. Yeah. What would that entail? Well, uh, I don't feel actually I'm too far out on a limb. Barack Obama uh, has come uh, up with a, an idea, policy that they're pushing, uh, you know, program of national 
civic service for young people. I think Canada and Canadians could benefit hugely from uh, providing young people with, uh, with a period between when they finish high school and continue on with their adult life where the federal government would step in and help them with uh, grants for continuing education, but say to those young people, we want you to give uh, eight or nine months uh, to your country through civic service. Yes, that could be military service, but it's not exclusive to military service. It could be service in your community. It could be service overseas. Uh, we used to have something, well, we still do, but it's, it's much smaller than it should be and was, was Katimovic, mm -hmm. which was a great experience. You talked to graduates of Katimovic, traveled across the country, who got out of those regional kind of silos and identities and built relationships uh, with other friends that continue to this day, decades later. We need a kind of uh, a Katimovic on steroids, a super Katimovic to get a whole generation of young Canadians from all classes, all ethnicities, all regions uh, into uh, uh, an understanding that, yes, their citizenship is a right, it's a right of birth, but it also is something that's earned. And it's earned by you know, working for the betterment of your community, uh, the betterment of your country. Name of the book is Who We Are, A Citizen's Manifesto. Roger, good to have you on TVO as always. I really enjoyed it. Thanks.